Well, hey guys, I am so glad you're here with us today. I have a question. Actually, before I get into my message, I'm wearing our Serve Day shirt. Man, Serve Day was so awesome. It was so great. And, 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 and we, we, when we're getting into it, I'm going to be honest with you guys, the school asked us to do some landscaping. And my history of landscaping is I have my own private company called Jacob's Janky Yard Service. So, so you know, it's not that good. And so I was like, man, okay, I hope we can do this. But then people showed up, and people who knew what they were doing were there. So that was good. And it was, it's so cool. If you want to look at the courtyard, feel free to, to go down that hall and look out there. It's just a little bit past the library over there. Um, but throughout the whole summer, we're actually going to continue to work on it. We bought some mulch, but who knows? Mulch is deceptive. <laughs> so, so, so we need to mulch some more out there. So kind of throughout the whole summer, we're going we're gonna to keep blessing the school and, and doing that, okay? So thank you for everyone who came out. And if you are looking for ways to serve the community, check out our Acts of Kindness table. Here you go. We, we want to be a church. You want to know what kind of church we don't want to be? We don't want to be a blood-sucking leech church. What do I mean by that? That we just want people to come here, come here, just come to Sunday, give all your money, come to Sunday, that's it. No. No, we want to be a church that's empowering people to do the thing that Jesus called us to do. It was to go and make disciples. Come on. To go out and serve. And so we believe service is so important. Ready, set, serve. If you want to see a difference in the world, don't wait for all the laws to get passed, all the things to happen. You make a difference. All right? With that being said, I got a question for you. Have you ever had doubt before? Have you ever had doubt before? Like, have you ever been in a church service and you started singing the songs and you're singing? You're like, man, I'm singing so good. I could be on the worship team right now. You're singing so good, but you're starting to sing. And as you're singing, you think to yourself, who am I singing to? Have you ever had a moment when you're in prayer and you're trying to pray and you're like, am I just talking to myself? Have you ever had doubt before? Have you ever had skeptical thoughts about God or church or just life in general, have you ever doubted God? Well, unless you're better than all the disciples in the Bible, all of us experience moments of doubt, moments of uncertainty. Check this out. Matthew 28 says this. This is after the resurrection of Christ. Check this out. It says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, this is a resurrected Jesus. So they just saw him um, they saw him crucified and buried. This is a resurrected Jesus. They worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Some of them doubted. Today we are starting a series called Doubting God, and to the title of today's message is Dealing with Your Doubt. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to be here one more time, okay? We prayed a lot today, but hey, it's good to talk to Jesus, all right? Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Be in here. We want more of you, Lord. Lord, as we navigate this series of doubt, fear, worry, anxiety, lead us towards your heart. Embrace us. God, we want more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You want to know one of the strangest things we do as humans? If you don't do it, you're better than me. But one of the strangest things we do is if we see something bad happen in someone else's life, especially someone that we don't really like, we get encouraged by it. Don't be lying at church today. Have you ever noticed that? Like, like, for, some, like, like for some reason, it's rather encouraging to me that the disciples had doubt when they even saw the resurrected Jesus. And the reason why that's encouraging to me, because, man, if those guys who saw the resurrected Jesus can have doubt, that makes me feel not so bad about myself when I have doubt. That makes me feel not so bad about me. So I, I remember, but it's, it's weird, it's a human nature that we have. When someone else is struggling, sometimes it can make you feel a little bit more encouraged about your life. Like if you're a parent and you see someone else's kid throwing a temper tantrum, you're like, wow, I guess I'm not that bad of a parent then, because look at those snot-nosed kids, you know? Yeah, so I, I remember this one time when I was a youth pastor, I took this young man who just graduated high school to a church internship in Maine. He was kind of reluctant to go. His parents wanted him, him, his parents mainly wanted him to do it because they were like, you ain't staying at our house and you ain't going to college or having a job, so you can do this internship. And so they asked me as, the, as his pastor to take him on this trip. So we, so we drive all the way out to Maine. You know how far it is to drive out to Maine? It's a long ride. 
Uh, and so we drive out to Maine. We get there, and we're in the middle of nowhere. What I later discovered is the hometown of Stephen King. Scary. <laughs> so, and, uh, and, and then we're driving, and then he gets a text from his parents that said, Mom's car broke down. Pray we can fix it so we can drive up and see you next week. When the kid reads the text message, he smiles and is happy, and he's like, yeah, they got what was coming to him. Then, right when he said that, as we're driving in Stephen King, Maine, where all the weird stuff happens, as he's driving, and he says that, pop, his tire pops. And I'm like, man... You, get what, you reap what you sow. <laughs> so so we're, we're literally in this place of, of nowhere, and, and, and his tire blew out. But the thing that I wanted to highlight, it was funny that he was happy that his parents got bad news. Like, that made him feel better about himself. But isn't that an interesting thing about human nature? We see other people struggling, and sometimes it makes us feel better. Sometimes it makes us feel better, and it makes and it makes me, like I mentioned, feel so much better that the disciples saw the resurrected Christ and still had doubt. Because sometimes I can feel so close to God. Sometimes I can feel so close, and then sometimes I can feel so far. Sometimes I can still have doubt. I don't know if you can relate, but there's times that I was like, God is so real, and God is so close. And when I pray, I know He hears me. And when I sing, I'm singing to Him. They're so clo- God's so close to me that if someone wants to say to me that God's not real, I'll look at them and say, your mama's not real. That's how close he is to me. But then there's other times I can be in the middle of the presence of God, like in a church service just like this, and all of a sudden, with all other people around me singing, doing all the spiritual stuff, I can feel like, is this stuff real? Am I making this up right now? I mean, I prayed about this, and God didn't show up. And it can be a really, really scary and lonely place in Christian circles when you start to doubt. When you start to doubt. It's scary, and you want to ask questions, but sometimes you wonder, am I the only one? Am I the only one? And if I ask this, what are they going to think about? What do they think about me? And you might want to ask, but you feel guilty or feel ashamed. Now, here you go. I've been pastoring I've been a pastor for over 10 years now, believe it or not. And, and I'm, more now than ever, I'm convinced that people aren't leaving the church because God isn't good. People aren't leaving the church because Jesus isn't worthy of following. People are leaving the church because they don't feel safe asking questions. People are leaving the church because the church is not a safe place to have doubt. We, have, we use statements like, come as you are, But the moment someone sins, we want to kick them off a serve team. I'm going there. And the church, in its attempt to be righteous, has rejected the sinners and become insecure about having tough theological conversations. And I'm convinced that there are some people that just feel like they can't safely express their doubts. To that question, I say, do you ever battle with doubt? Do you ever have doubt? Do you ever have things that come in your head and you wonder why it's there? See, I see several reasons why we have doubts. One of the reasons is questions that can't be answered. We have questions that we can't find the answers to. You may come across something in the Bible and you say, well, it says that there, but then it says that here in this part of the Bible. What does that mean? I'm not quite sure how to understand it. It can be a question that confuses you. Sometimes there's situations that seem unfair. There's situations that seem unfair. You're thinking, okay, if I prayed about it and God could, but God didn't, does that mean he loves me? Does that mean he cares for me? This is a real question. These are real questions. And there's a bad thing that happens. There's bad things that happen to this good person, but a good thing that happened to that bad person. Like, what's up with that? And then there's stuff like we see on the news, innocent children dying. We see wars. We see all this stuff going on. And we say, where is God in all of that? Where is God in all that? Sometimes it's because there are hurts that can't be resolved. There's hurts that can't be resolved. You looked up to someone, and they were a Christian, or, and then they end up doing something horrible, or you felt like church was a safe place, and you have a church experience that, unfortunately, church wasn't safe for you. 
And then sometimes, and if I can for a second, can I just talk to the Jesus followers for a second? Sometimes Jesus followers, Christians, sometimes we make it even worse. There's some Christians, I would say, that don't have much grace, even though we serve a God of grace. Anyway, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of Christians that don't have any bend. They don't have any bend. What do I mean by that? There's, there's, there's no bend. With good intentions, they'll use the bumper sticker theology that says something like, it's in the Bible, so I believe it. You, don't even, you ain't even read the Bible. You just put the bumper sticker on your car. You don't even know the original context in which the scripture was written. Don't get me going today. Because people have made doctrines that even eliminate a woman's ability to lead because they can't read the Bible correctly. Come on. But sometimes everything's not black and white. Sometimes the world is complicated. And when someone has a question and they can't find an answer, and when someone hurt them, and there's a theological question they have, and they feel let down, and they feel like they need help in a situation, and if there's not a lot of bend, if we're not willing to bend and listen, you know what happens to a person if you're not willing to bend? They break. They break, and they walk away, and we especially see this among young people. In record numbers, young people are not coming to church, are not coming to church. I'm going to get into that. See, sometimes people have questions, and when there's no bend, they feel they can only walk away. And what I want to show you this week, what Aaron and I want to show you, because we're going to tag team this series for the rest of the summer, what we're going to show you for the rest of the week is that your doubts handled properly can actually be the thing that leads you to stronger faith. Your doubts handled properly can lead you to stronger faith. Your doubts don't have to take you away from God. Your doubts can actually draw you closer to a loving God who's for you and not against you who has a plan and purpose for your life, because it's so important to understand. This is so important to understand. It's important to understand that your faith journey, that your faith is a journey, it's not a destination. Your faith is a journey, it is not a destination. Your faith, you never just arrive. I did it. I did, I've done all the classes, everybody. I, got, I did all the work, I went through, I graduated, I got my MBA in faith now. I got, my, I got my PhD in faith. I got, I, got, I got it all down. You don't ever arrive at faith. There's no such thing. Here you go. You got today, and you got you to follow Jesus today. You got to follow Jesus today. And that's why we're going to dive deep into this topic in the upcoming weeks. But, but here you go. I want to talk to some people who have parents. I mean, we all got parents. I want to talk to some people who have kids. And I want to talk to some people who got parents, too. I'm joking. I want to talk to some people who are raising kids in church today. At some point, don't be surprised when your kid starts to wrestle with doubt and start to ask some questions. If it happens, don't panic when they start to ask questions. Here you go. You want to hear this one? My four-year-old daughter. My, she's awesome. My four-year-old daughter, Kingsley, asked me a few, a few weeks ago, why does God take the people we love to heaven? Why does God take the people we love to heaven, which was followed by a legitimate sobbing of how much she misses her pops, Aaron's dad, who passed away, then led to, is Nana going to go to heaven? Is Mame and Papa going to go to heaven? Am I never going to see them ever again? You want to know how hard it is to explain the hope of heaven to a four-year-old? But these are legitimate questions. That, that, that a four-year-old has. So if a four-year-old has a question, you know your 14-year-old is going to have questions. See, what I want to do, mom and dad, is, is recognize that, that your kids, they've grown up watching your faith. They've seen faith in you, and sometimes you're in the middle of being a hypocrite in your faith. Me too. Me too. And they notice that you have a faith, and they'll start asking questions, and, and their questions are helping them trying to understand, can your faith become my faith too? Can your faith become the faith that I have too? Which is not a bad thing. Because here's the thing, if they're not asking you about these kind of questions, they are going to ask TikTok. And that's a scary road to go down. Because here you go, here you go. If, if there's questions, if there's doubt, this is not a time to panic. It's a time to process. It's a time to talk because the church and the home should be the safest place in the world to ask hard questions. 
The church in the home should be the safest place to ask hard questions. And I hope that you'll discover the strongest faith isn't a faith that never doubts. The strongest faith is a faith that grows through the doubts, that grows through your doubts. If you never doubt, I may question if you ever really have faith. Because if you never had doubt, you don't need faith. Faith is something that you don't know if it's going to happen. I don't know if this is going to work out the way I hope. I don't know if God's going to come through on the other side of this. But I'm going to keep walking towards him because he's called me to be obedient in every season of life. For example, Thomas, good old Thomas in the Bible. Good old Thomas in the Bible. After the resurrection in John 10, check this out. One of the 12 Thomas, nicknamed a twin, he sounds hardcore, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. And now it's funny, when you read this, when you study this in the Greek, the Greek language, this verb is like an active tense. So basically, it's like the, it's, you say it over and over again. So the disciples basically sound like a kid who's in the back of a seat of a car who's ready to get somewhere. Are we there yet? 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 When they run up to Thomas, they're like, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. We've seen him. We've seen him. We've seen him. Like, he's like, who? We've seen Jesus. They're pumped. They're hyped. They're, they're so excited that they've seen Jesus. But check out the response of Thomas. We've seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hand and put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his wound inside. And, and, and that is the reason that Thomas is known as what? Doubting Thomas. I'm here to tell you Thomas is getting a bad rep. <laughs> Thomas is getting a bad rep. He really is. In fact, my goal is to dignify his doubts today. Because the only reason why the other guys were all excited and believing was because they saw him, because they saw Jesus. They sent Thomas to the store to pick up dinner. He came back with a bag full of food line and groceries, and he's like, I missed who? I don't believe it. Let me see his hands. Let me see it. And then we built his whole theology about how he's like this doubting guy. He was like, he's like, I'm just trying to get the food run, and I missed out. I'm guessing that Thomas is like a lot of you. He's been through some stuff before. Come on. He's been through some stuff, and the stuff that he's been through, the disappointments that he's had in life, the heartbreaks that he's experienced has caused him to be a little bit more skeptical. Caused him to be a little bit, put some walls up. I can't trust that. I believed in Jesus. He was resurrected. I mean, he, he was crucified. I thought he was going to be our Savior. Now I'm hurt. I can't, I can't go there. I can't go there. In fact, Oswald Chambers once said, doubt is not always a sign of a man, uh, that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he is thinking. Your doubts don't disqualify your faith. Tom, Thomas actually doesn't get talked much about compared to Peter, James, and John, some of the other disciples. But Thomas was a shaker and a mover. He was a man of big faith. I'll show you two reasons why. One of the reasons, uh, if you know the Gospels, there's a guy named Lazarus. And Lazarus, he, he died. And he was dead for four days. He was dead. The King James Version of the Bible said that he stinketh. That's how I feel about my babies. Your diaper stinketh right now. Four days later, he stinketh. And you know what Thomas did? Thomas went to Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, so and check this out, John 11. So then he, Jesus, told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, also known as T. Diddy, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with them. Like, what does that mean? If Jesus went back to the city where Lazarus was buried, there was a threat that they were going to take Jesus and, and kill him there. So that's why Jesus was actually hesitant on going back. Well, maybe that's not why he was hesitant. It's a good story. I'll preach it one day. But, but, but they, that's, why he, that's why they were hesitant to go back to that part of town. But this is Thomas. He's saying, hey, if they're going to kill us, let us go out with Jesus then. Let us go out. That's not a lack of faith. That's someone that has tremendous faith. That's someone that has, has a whole bunch of faith. Then there's another time in John's gospel, in, in John 14, when Jesus said to them, he said, hey, I'm going away. I'm going to a place called heaven. And Thomas is like, whoa, whoa. Oh, Jesus, um, if we don't know where you're going, how can we go where you're going? 
See, this was a sincere question Thomas had. This was the guy who was like, hey, I want to be near you, Jesus. You just got to tell me where you're going. I just need some details. I just need my answer. I just need my questions answered. I need some details. Thomas just wanted to know for himself. And here you go. Your kids one day, they're just going to want to know from yourself. You, you may have doubt. And you just want to know for yourself. And it is okay to ask God questions. It is okay to process, especially when you've been through hurt. Especially when you've gone through trauma in your life. Don't listen to anyone that just says, oh, well, you'll get through it. God's for you. God's good all the time. And all the time, God is good. He is good all the time. But there's still stuff you got to deal with. There's still things that happen that can make you doubt. Does God have a good plan for my life? Because this don't look like it. There's still things that happen. Talk to Jesus about it. Keep pressing into the things of God. Watch how Jesus responds to Thomas in his doubt. Check this out. This is what Scripture says, John 8, I mean, John 20. It says this, Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas wasn't at Food Lion. No, this time Thomas was with them. So here you go. I want you to notice something. I want you to get this in you. Eight days later, Thomas already expressed his doubt. Thomas already said, no, that can't be, that ain't happening. That didn't happen. But you know what Thomas did, even in his doubt? Thomas showed back up again. Thomas showed back up again. Even in the middle of his doubt, when he wasn't sure, he showed back up again. And if there's anyone in here who has ever been hurt, who's ever had doubts, whoever has struggles, whoever had fears, whoever felt like they don't understand where God has taken them in life, one of the most spiritual things you can do is show back up again. It's just show back up again. You're praying and you're praying and you prayed for healing, but that person didn't get healed. And you're kind of resistant on praying again because the person that you love is not no, no longer with you. And you're saying to yourself, should I pray? Should I talk? Does God listen to me? One of the most spiritual things you can do is just show back up and pray again. If you're going through some anxious thoughts and some worries and doubts, and you're thinking to yourself, when I worship, does God even respond to me? And you're not sure you want to know what you should do? You should just worship again. Show back up again. Show back up again. Show back up even in your doubts. And Nick, you can come on. Drop something nice up here for us. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. And check this out. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hand. Put your finger here. Look at my side. I want you to get this. Because sometimes we misread Jesus. I think sometimes this next part, we read this as, as, here you go, the way you view God often can be based on the relationship you had with your father. And if you had an aggressive, abusive, absent father, sometimes you view the words of, the, of Father God that way. That's kind of heavy, but we're going to start some groups called Freedom in, 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 the, in the winter. I know God wants to heal us. See, here you go. God doesn't just want you to come to church and have feel-good moments and then just leave and get stuck back into the world. God wants absolute freedom for your life. God wants healing for your life. And if we're going to be the local church, because I believe the local church mobilized is the hope of the world. If we're going to be the local church, we got to go to those deep places with people. Deep cries out to deep, Scripture tells us. The deepest parts of us are longing to be healed from some of the deepest wounds that we've experienced. And I'm going to tell you guys this. I don't say this because I'm prideful. I think I got all the answers in the world. I'm telling you the truth. As best as I can tell, only Jesus can heal those places. Only Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can heal those father wounds, can heal those mother wounds sibling wounds, all the different wounds that we have. Only Jesus can. What did Jesus do? This is what he said to him. And I, and, and I don't want you to read it from the ears of like this. I, he's not saying, don't be faithless any longer. Believe. No, 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 no. That's not how he's saying. 
Jesus is saying to Thomas, dude, here I am. Here I am. Don't be faithless. Believe. I want you to notice what did Jesus do? How did Jesus respond to a doubter? Jesus came to Thomas and gave Thomas exactly what he asked for. He gave him exactly what he asked for. Because our God is a loving Father who desires intimate relationship with his kids. Scripture says if you know how to, good, get, how to give good gifts to your kids, what do you think your Father in Heaven is going to do? In this moment, Jesus proved that God is not distant in your doubts. Someone needs to hear this. Jesus is not a standoff Savior, but He's willing to be touched. He desires for you to be in his lap. And if you reach out to him, you'll discover that he was reaching out to you already. You can ask questions. You can take your frustrations to him. You can wrestle with him. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this. When you wrestle with Jesus, when you wrestle with God, you're going to walk a little differently. I'm going to get off my there's a story in the Bible about a man named Jacob. That's a good name. He, and this was a man. This was a man of skepticism and doubts. This was a man that always felt second best. He always felt inadequate to his brother and to the people around him. And there's this one story. It's a crazy story that he was up all night and then God met him. God met him in the middle of nowhere. You want to know where God's going to meet you sometime? In the middle of that fear, in the middle of that doubt, in the middle of that anxious hurt, in that middle of where you say, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know why I did what I did. And God will meet you in the middle of nowhere. And Jacob was in the middle of nowhere. And then God met him. And the Bible says that he wrestled with God all night long. He WWE'd him. He wrestled God all night long. And, and Jacob says, I won't release you until you bless me. And then God says, well, what's your name? He said, what's your name then? He said, my name's Jacob. He said, my name's Jacob. Jacob's whole life, he wanted to be everyone else but Jacob. And then after he finally said, this is who I am, God tapped his, tapped his hip. He had a little Snoop Dogg pimp walk after that. Can I say that in church? I think I can. I did that. I'm going to let you know, when you wrestle with God, when you talk to God, when you spend time with God, when you daily spend time with your loving Father, you will start to walk a little differently. You'll start to walk with, man, I'm going through the same circumstance I went through yesterday, but, but I got a little bit more hope today. The people around me haven't changed. They're still doing this and that, but, but I got a little bit more joy today in my heart. My walk's changing a little bit. My step's changing a little bit because we serve a God who is not far out, who's not out there somewhere, but we serve a God that says, partner up with me. I'll take, take my yoke upon you. I'll walk beside you. I'll do this with you. I'll go through the struggle with you. I'll go through the pain with you. I'll go through the trial with you. We don't serve a God who's out there, but we serve a God who's Emmanuel, God with us. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this. We live in a world that's desperate for a touch of hope. Desperate, searching, and seeking. And they keep coming to the wrong conclusion. Like Thomas, I won't believe it unless I see it. 
I won't believe it unless I see it. And who's the vehicle? What's the vehicle? What's the vehicle of church? We have a choice. What's the instrument that God decided to show himself to the world? Oh, it's the local church. It's us. It's you and it's me. And I'm going to tell you this, friends. If we are ever going to make a difference in a doubting world, it's not having a nice billboard out there and trying to bring people to church. It's not just sending mailers out and advertising, oh, come to my church. There's a hundred churches down the street. You want to know how we meet a doubting world? That our lives, that your life is radically transformed by Jesus. And then you live out what people are honestly seeking. Come on, someone. I don't even know where I'm at in my best no more. Here you go. I've been honest with you guys this whole time I've been a pastor. I've been honest about my doubts and our struggles, even how we got to here. Man, it's been a hard road. There's been times that Aaron and I, we thought to ourselves, we must have been crazy. We didn't hear from God. We must have ate too much nachos. But every step of the way, every step of the way, come on. God has been faithful. And what I want you to recognize, your, your faith is a journey. It's not a destination. And faith isn't the absence of, absence of doubt, but faith is the means to push through it. It's the means to push through it. Scripture tells us in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. What do you do when you're in a valley? You walk through it. What do you do when you're in a valley? You make it through it. You keep walking. You keep moving. You keep going. You keep pressing through. You keep swimming. Don't get me saying Dory up in here. Got a lot of kids. More than I thought. I love this. But when you're in the valley of the shadow of doubt, in your doubt, don't let your doubt be a dead end. But if you're in that valley, keep walking, keep showing back up, keep asking questions, keep trusting God. And you don't have to be faithless anymore. Draw closer to Jesus, and he will come to you. So what do we do? I got one practical application for us today. We got the next six weeks of this series we're looking forward to. But my one practical application for us today is this. In our doubt, what do we do? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And you come to Jesus with your pain. Come to Jesus with your doubt. Just come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. So Jesus, we come to you right now. We ask for more of you. We ask for your goodness and your favor. We ask that you give us eyes to see what you're doing, even in seasons that seem so hard. In moments of fear, doubt, depression, the things didn't go as planned, you were there every step of the way. So Jesus, we invite you. We say, come to Jesus. We come to you. know this Jesus I'm talking about, or maybe you have, but life got in a way. If you want to make a decision right now just to come to Jesus, I want to pray with you. I'm not going to call you out or have you come up front, nothing like that. Just right where you are in your chair. If you want to make a decision to come to Jesus, I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. You can say it out loud or you can say it in your heart, whatever you're comfortable with. I just want you to say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I come to you. Forgive me for my mistake. Make me new. Help me in my disbelief. Trust me. In Jesus. Amen.